You love him tonight, don't you? I mean, we've had a great day today. Beautiful, beautiful weather. This is my favorite time of the year. So, so good. I enjoy the cool nights and mornings and the warm days. It's just a, such a blessing to be in East Tennessee. So thankful for that. Some of you know the world's in a powder keg right now. Tell you what, we've never lived in a more volatile time than we're in as we speak. And I hope that and I pray that each of you and those of you that are listening by Facebook, we welcome you tonight. Pray that you're ready to go home. And if you're not ready to go home, you you better ought to get ready. You better ought to, I don't know if that's good English or not, but you better ought to. This is, a, this is a good time to get to, it's a good time to get revived, refreshed, renewed, restored, rededicated, rekindled, whatever you need. How many of you know that this is the 24th week that we've been in the book of Revelation? Not steady. We've took a few breaks here and there, uh, just like when uh, Teresa and I were out of town or whatever. But uh, we've, uh, we've uh, been going since uh, April, back in April, studying the book of Revelation, and it has really gone by fast. It seems like it's just really sped along, at least it has for me. I hope you are enjoying this. Tonight we're getting a little bit deeper into the book as we're going to be looking. It's already the 18th of October. Uh, Y'all got your Christmas presents ordered yet? Everybody getting, getting ready for Christmas. It's right around the, as the old saying goes, it's right around the corner, and uh, Santa Claus will be coming, but... Anyway, I'm so glad that you're here tonight on Wednesday night with us. I know most of you or many of you have worked today and you're tired, but you pushed forth and you came on to the house of the Lord, and I really appreciate that. It's good to have Macy with us tonight. I told her a while ago if she had been here Sunday, it would have been a little bit brighter in here. Praise the Lord. But I'm glad that she got to come tonight. We're thankful for that. We did get her a lamp so she can let her little light shine. And uh, thanks to all of you, Alf, I guess you made that post for uh, Facebook about putting a picture of your little lamp up. Thank you for doing that. And, uh, oh, Joy did that. Okay. All right. Well, thanks to whoever did it, and thanks to you guys for putting your pictures in. Uh, everybody, everybody that does that, the more we share that on Facebook, the more the people know what's going on and the more excitement gets generated for what God's doing. It's not got anything to do with me. It's not got anything to do with a personality except for the personality of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who that we are trying to exalt. And that's who whose light that we're, we're trying to shine. Because we don't have His light. We are in most darkness, aren't we? We're in most darkness. So this evening we're going to be looking at chapters 15 and 16. I've got them both ready. I'm not sure that we'll get to them tonight. It's already a quarter to eight, so I don't think that we'll get through both chapters tonight. I was going to try. All seven bowls are in the, the mixture of chapters 15 and 16, and I don't think that we'll be able to get through all of that, but we will try as hard as we can and get as far as we can. Father, thank you so much tonight, Lord, for each person that's here. Thank you, Lord, for giving health in our bodies. Thank you for giving us safety. Thank you for giving us a wonderful place here on the side of East Broadway to worship and to praise you. I appreciate all the children back in the back, Lord, the nursery, the boys and girls clubs. I thank you that down the parking lot and out in the driveway, they're having a, a service tonight, the youth and the driven. And I just thank you, Lord, that out underneath the stars, you're going to be magnified and blessed and, and praised. And here in the sanctuary, God, we're going to lift up your name, and you promised a blessing to those who would study the book of Revelation. And so, Father, we're doing that tonight, and as we study this word, we're trying our best to apply it to our lives. And Lord, according to your word, that's a double blessing. If we read it, we're blessed. If we apply it, we're blessed again. So thank you for the blessings. Thank you, God, for those you've sent here. Help us to please you in all we do. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. And the church said, so this entire chapter of chapter 15, starting with, is a necessary introduction to the vials or to the bowls that we're going to be talking about of God's wrath, which represent the final 
and the awesome, if I can use that word awesome, judgments of God. The reason I say awesome is because they are so profound. Nothing has ever been seen like it until this time. The Bible says there's never been a time that is, that is as fearful and as dreadful as this Daniel's 70th week. So these are the greatest and the most awful judgments that are coming upon planet earth. And this here now, as we open up into chapter 15, we're headed on down toward the end of the tribulation period, on down toward the end of Daniel's 70th week. We're past the three and a half year mark. We're easing on down toward the end. These vials, these bowls that begin to get poured out, when we get toward the seventh one, the last one, there's seven of them, when we get down toward the last one, you will see that that's the beginning of the Battle of Armageddon. And I don't know if you've been looking at the news, but things are stacking up just exactly like Scripture said that they would. The nation of Iran is supporting and sponsoring this Hezbollah and all of these terrorists. There's money there. Iran and Russia are trying to tie together, probably already have, under the covers. So there's a whole lot going on, and all I know to do is tell you, look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. Look up. If you're attached to something here on earth that's got you too attached to where your attention is not on Jesus, you better be cutting some cords because the Lord will let you stay here. Did you hear me? I said the Lord will allow you to stay here if you're more attached to earth than you are to heaven. If you're more attached to the things of this earth than you are Him, he will allow you to stay, and as you go through the, the 70th week, the tribulation period, uh, hopefully those cords will get cut. But you don't want to have to go through that to get, get released from planet Earth. So John now sees seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God will be finished. This is the final set of the trio of seven judgments. We had the seven seals, we had the seven trumpets, and now we have seven bowls, or also called the seven vials, a bowl and a vial. It's referencing the same thing, the seven vials of wrath. I'm going to be reading chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to read it straight through, and then we're going to walk on in and start breaking some stuff down. So let's look at it together, the seven Bowls of wrath. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifest. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. Out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God, and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. So let's look at this for a few minutes. I'm going to start out talking about a great sign in heaven, this great sign in heaven. The Bible says, and another sign was seen in heaven, its contents containing the seven last plagues filled with the wrath of God. The seven angels having these plagues will not be regular angels. 
but seven redeemed men who are in heaven with glorified bodies at the time of the fulfillment of this book. Did you hear what I said? I'm going to say that again. I'm not sure that everybody teaches this, but I'm teaching it because I believe that that's what it is, and I'm going to run a reference and show you why here just in a few minutes. Remember we said when we started the book of Revelation, if you can take something literal at face value, take it for what it says. Sometimes angels, when it says angels, is referring, that original word, if you look it up, is messenger. It could be preacher, it could be teacher, it could be man, it could be angelic being, that original word. So if you can take it face value, and if it seems good for that, if nothing else mingles in or discounts or discredits that, then stick with that. But in this particular sense, there's another verse that comes in that ties this thing together that shows us that this is not an angel with like we, like we know the angels that stand before the Lord, like uh, Michael and Gabriel and those angels. These are men. These are men that have been uh, glorified in their glorified body. Let me give you some reasoning here as we go on through this. The seven angels having these plagues will not be regular angels, but seven redeemed men who are in heaven with glorified bodies at the time of the fulfillment of this book. As was previously noted, in the early part of the book of Revelation, angels sometimes refer to men. The literal translation, as I just told you, is messenger. Now listen to this. According to Revelation 17 and 1, chapter 17, verse 1. We haven't gotten there yet. But John was shown the judgment of the great whore and the beast that carried her. This was carried out by one of these angels. And when John fell down at his feet to worship him, he was told by this angel, Are you listening close? See that you do not do it, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. And he says, Worship God only. Worship God only. So the angel clearly declares that he is a redeemed man. And if that be the case, they must all be redeemed men since they are all referred to in one expression. In other words, John is not saying this group of angels did this. And then here he's starting another conversation. This group of angels did something. No, it's all together. It's all referencing a group of men. So that tells us that this whole group of angels or messengers that's referenced here are men that have glorified bodies. That redeemed men should take part in administering God's vengeance on His enemies is entirely reasonable. So the sea of glass is another parenthetical expression. Now, what did we say parenthetical meant? It means when you're making an expression and you put parentheses around it, it stands out. In other words, this lady who was talking to me, this lady, parentheses, had blonde hair. You see what I'm saying? You put parentheses around it, it's a parenthetical statement. So the sea of glass is a parenthetical expression, and it's seen here by John, and it's the same one that he saw when he was caught up into heaven in Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. This is an actual pavement before the throne. Now, some commentaries, and I've read many of them as I've studied this, I've, I've, I've dug through I don't know how much stuff, but many of the commentaries say that this sea of glass represents humanity. But I disagree with that. I don't think that's right at all. I don't think God is having humanity stand before Him and that it's all different colored. And, and This is an actual pavement before the throne which is likened to crystal mingled with fire. This area is now, as we read, occupied by the tribulation martyrs, whereas in chapter 4, it was unoccupied. Now, I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about as we're studying and reading this story in John, as John is seeing this vision. Now the martyrs are there. Remember we said 
that the martyrs, the Revelation martyrs, the 144,000 in specific will be raptured up somewhere right around or a little after the first three and a half years. They're going to be preaching the gospel and then they're going to get raptured in mid part. So we're seeing them here now on that sea of glass before God's throne. So let's dig in a little bit deeper. The sea of glass is indescribably beautiful. Its population embraces saints who have harps of God, who sing with the song of Moses and the Lamb because they are victorious and have been resurrected. There is no exclamation as to the exact words of the song of the Lamb, but undoubtedly its theme is one of victory. In this scripture, which is the sixth parenthetical passage in Revelation, the position is shown of those who gain victory over the beast. And this insertion shows the blessedness of those who did not worship the beast and who were victorious over him. These are those who remain faithful to Christ and refuse to worship the Antichrist or receive his mark. Now, in heaven, they are standing on a sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. These are tribulation martyrs, and they're singing a victory song. This song is similar to the celebration of Israel's deliverance from Egypt found in, in Exodus chapter 15. However, this song celebrates the ultimate deliverance through Christ's death on the cross of God's people from Satan. It praises God for His amazing deeds, His justice, truth, holiness, and righteousness. Next, John looks and sees the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven, and it's open. Out of it, from God's presence, come the seven angels with the seven plagues. One of the four living creatures gives the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God. No one can enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels are finished. After the vision of the tribulation saints upon the sea of glass, the vision of the seven angels and the heavenly tabernacle is resumed. The temple in heaven is mentioned 12 times in the book of Revelation. There is every indication that this temple is the literal temple and God literally sits on His throne in this temple. Can you say, praise the Lord? As proof that the temple of heaven is literal, we recall that both the tabernacle of Moses and the temple of Solomon were patterned after the temple in heaven. The same words which are used of an earthly temple or tabernacle are also used of the heavenly one. So we're not seeing two different terminologies here. We're seeing the same word, the temple of Solomon, the temple of God in heaven. Both of them are temples. It may be difficult for some to imagine there being building materials and thrones in heaven, but this is precisely what is meant. Now I'm going to come back there, pray I don't lose my place, but i got to take a break just a minute right here and expound on something. There are people today, many, many people in Christendom across the world that believe that once we leave this physical body that we're going to float around on clouds throughout heaven spreading cream cheese on a pastry and floating around on a cloud. Can I tell you that's never been God's plan. That's somebody's dream up imagination that's never been God's plan but I will tell you this if I'm here on planet earth and I want to visit Jupiter or I want to visit Mars or I want to visit heaven I believe that in a split second our bodies can go how do you know that brother Dale I know that because I I saw what Jesus did through the scripture through the word how many of you go into this scripture? It's exciting to me. I like to feel like that I'm walking there. I, I, I got to go to Israel a long time ago and walk on the, the, the sandy shore where, where Jesus walked. I got to go out on the, the Sea of Galilee, and what a, what a joy. Some of you, I know, have been there, and it's such a joy to do that. But as you think about Jesus, and we have so many people that don't know what life after death is going to be like. And I'm, I'm not a pro in that. I'm not trying to stand up here and tell you that I know everything. But the Scriptures ask a question, how shall we be 
How will it be after death? We don't know how we shall be, the Scripture says, but we know, say it with me, I know, I know that I shall be like Him. Like who? Like Jesus. Well, we have a divine example in the Scripture. Jesus died a literal death. He had a body, a physical body, just like you and me. He bled, he hurt, he got hungry, he experienced pain, he had a physical body, he got tired. All the symptoms, all the similar things that you and I go through of a human body. And when it came down to the end, he bled real blood. It was the blood of God, but it was real blood that came out of his veins. He died a real death. His heart stopped beating. And his body went into the grave. Dead. A dead body went into the grave. But on Sunday morning, hallelujah, he came out of the grave triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. And when he came out of the grave, that body is the body that I'm going to have. Because as he is, so shall we be. And the Bible says... Just a little bit later, the disciples were in a room and it was all locked up. They were scared to death and trembling. They was afraid that somebody was going to come and arrest them and crucify them. And here comes Jesus walking through the wall. That's the kind of body I want. I want to go over yonder. I don't have to go through the door. I can go through over yonder. Why is that important, Brother Dale? It's not, but it's just. I think it's just awesome. Because I'm going to be like Jesus. So then just a little bit later, the disciples decided to go fishing. Peter said, I'm going fishing. Everybody else went fishing with him. They looked over on the seashore and there's Jesus cooking fish. Now this is the guy that died, that rose again. And he told Mary, he said, Mary, don't, don't, don't hold on to him. Don't hang on. I've not yet been to the Father. I believe he split secondly, went to heaven. I believe he... He took the sacrifice, he paid it, he came back. He's cooking fish now for his disciples, and the disciples come on shore, and they eat breakfast with him. How many of you say hallelujah to getting to eat? I'm not sure what happens to the food when you put it in this body. But I can tell you this, I'm going to eat when I get there. If I couldn't eat, there'd be no needing. There'd be no need for the marriage supper, supper of the Lamb. I've never been to a supper where you couldn't eat. And I'm going to eat and not gain weight. Hallelujah. So understand something. Life is not going to stop at death. And life is not going to be a total uh, mystical existence when we're resurrected with Jesus. It's not going to be that way. Now, you can't get this glorified body. You can't get it without one of two things happening. Number one, it's planted into the ground. That's the natural way of going by death. I'm not looking to go that way. I'm looking to go this way. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. That word changed right there is the same place we get the word metamorphosis. <laughs> Hallelujah. I get wanting to preach right here now because when we're changed, you see, we get that body that's like unto His body. This mortal shall put on immortality. This corruptible shall put on incorruption. We shall be like Jesus. And if we're going to be like Jesus, Jesus said, I'm going to let you rule and reign with me throughout all eternity. So the first thousand years is a kickoff time for the rest of eternity. We're going to get to rule and reign here on planet earth the way I understand this book. There's going to be people here that are mortal people. You and I, if we get born again here, we're going to be immortal because we got to change, right? So we'll be immortal, not subject to death anymore, not subject to overweight anymore, not subject to arthritis anymore. Hallelujah. 
Okay, I'll come back down to earth. Had to take a praise break. So it may be difficult for some people to imagine that being the building material and the thrones in heaven, but this is precisely what it means. The building materials are building materials. When it talks about stones, about the stones in that city, y'all know I love stones. Man, I can only imagine what walking up to that heavenly temple is going to look like with the 12 stones, 12 different stones. I, I, I taught on that one. You don't want to get me started. God served as the architect for the plans and the description of the temple as they were given to David and built by his son Solomon. We believe that the earthly design was similar to the heavenly design. As a matter of fact, I think that the heavenly one was the blueprint. This was true both of the tabernacle in the wilderness and of the great temple that was built. We see here that the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God. And then we look backwards when Solomon dedicated the temple. God's presence came and filled the place. And it was full of the glory of the Lord. And it appeared like a cloud until the priests could not stand to minister. This similarity is noted in the heavenly temple of which the other is a replica. John saw the temple in heaven filled with the smoke of the glory of God, this great sign in heaven. Let's jump now into chapter 16. There's no way we'll get finished, but we'll get a good start. Chapter 16, let's look at the first bowl, the first bowl of wrath. All right, chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of wrath, of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So John hears a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels to pour out the bowls of wrath that God has ordered upon the earth. When the first angel pours out his bowl of wrath, something similar to but more severe than the plague of boils. Have you noticed, you may before we get through this, the similarities to the plagues in Egypt, to these plagues that are being poured out here? We're going to cover them, listen to them. The severity of these boils were much worse that came upon, than what came upon the Egyptians. This describes malignant, oozing ulcers. And I know that sounds sickening, but that's what this is. This judgment is only on those who follow the Antichrist and receive his mark. Some speculate that the mark of the beast becomes infected and causes incurable suffering. So we don't know how that that mark is going to go on the head or on the hand. But there are some people, and I just noted that there, there are some commentaries that believe, due to the writing and the way it's written, that this could be an infection from that labeling or that branding of the, the name or the number of the Antichrist. So the first bowl that's poured out is directed directly to the people who receive the mark of the beast. Now understand, these people, first of all and foremost, they have no chance, no chance of ever being saved. Can you imagine living on planet earth with Satan's fury, the church is gone, everything that held back sin and, and evil and debauchery and all of this, this stuff that you're hearing about that happened from Hamas to the people there, uh, what, whatever you're hearing, we, we, we've heard of, of, of babies having their heads cut off. We've heard of babies and mothers being burned to death. It's horrific and horrendous. But we've not seen, planet Earth has not seen anything yet until the powers of the, of the saints of God are taken away and all sin is turned loose on planet Earth. That's going to be the norm then. And these people that we're talking about are branded. They've already accepted allegiance to the Antichrist. They've already been branded. And here they are suffering with these big boils and these sores all over their body. 
What a sickening thing. That's the first bowl of the wrath of God. Then let's go on and look at the second bowl. We've looked at the sign in heaven. We've looked at the first bowl. Now let's look at the second bowl. Found in Revelation 16, verse number 3. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. Isn't this exciting? Aren't you glad you're not going to have to be here? The second angel pours out his bowl into the sea, which becomes like the blood of a corpse. And everything in the sea, because of that, dies. It should be noted here that reference is made to the sea, and it is an actual S-E-A, C. It's an, uh, uh, it is a literal body of water. The reason I say that is because in past places, many places in the book of Revelation, that word sea, and it's not the same word, but it's called sea, is called the sea of humanity or mankind. But this is referring to a body of water. And we believe, I believe, that it must be the Mediterranean Sea that it's referring to around the kingdom where the Antichrist lives. This would not include the oceans, I don't think, because we have the oceans mentioned later on in Scripture. So this right here, I believe, is the Mediterranean Sea. The statement is that this vial will be as the blood of a dead man. The creatures in the sea will die in the changed and corrupted waters. The surface of the sea will be strewn with dead sea life, such as all the creatures of the sea and the dead bodies of the fish family. This will cause an unbearable odor, making it impossible for human life to be near these waters. Ships will be immovable as if ice-bound in heavily clogged areas. The conditions will be mortally foul, contributing greatly to disease and starvation for those who might be stranded on the sea at that time. One-third of the sea life has already been killed at the sound of the second trumpet. Remember when we had that back in chapter 8, the trumpet, the second trumpet sounded, and one-third of the sea life was killed. This is two-thirds now. The remaining two-thirds is going to be destroyed, I believe, there in the Mediterranean Sea. I don't have specifics for that. We're not told that it's the Mediterranean Sea, but I'm pretty sure that it's talking about the sea right there around where the Antichrist is controlling. So then, however, now all sea life is killed, causing unimaginable stench and pollution. And this is similar to the first plague in Egypt in Exodus chapter 7, verses 20 through 24. Going right along, I'm going to look at now the third plague the third bowl of wrath. Uh, looking at the third bowl of wrath. Revelation 16, 4 through 7. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. When the third angel pours out his bowl, the rivers and the springs become blood. The appalling part of this plague is that they will have only bloody water to drink. Can you imagine that? So here the ocean is bloody, and now the rivers and the springs are turning bloody. All the rivers of Italy, Turkey, Greece, Syria, and other parts of the Antichrist domain will be running with blood. Can you imagine that scenario? Some of you guys have been to Syria. Some of you have been over to Turkey and the military. Can you imagine that? It's a dry, arid area in most places anyway. The men suffering this vow are those who have shed the blood of saints and prophets and unmercifully tortured God's people on planet earth. 
they will be reaping what they have sown. They have shed blood, and now blood is everywhere. Plagues like this will be so phenomenal that they will get the attention of people from all over the world. The consequences will be staggering. John then hears the angel in charge of the waters, who is apparently the superintendent of God's water department during the tribulation. He declares that God is the eternal Holy One because He is sending this judgment because the people of earth have shed the blood of prophets and saints. So the angel in charge of the waters declares God's judgments are just and they are true. Let's smoke right along. The fourth bowl, the fourth bowl of wrath. We might accidentally get finished tonight. I hope that we, that we can. So let's look now at the fourth bowl of wrath. It's still in chapter 16, verses 8 and 9. Let's look at them. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. The power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give Him glory. So in this judgment, the sun's heat intensifies, scorching people with fire. I do believe that this is worldwide. I don't think that you can single out real easy a specific area. It could be worse in the area where the Antichrist is, but I believe that the whole world will be affected by this plague, by this judgment. It's clear something will happen to the ozone layer that protects the earth from the sun's deadly rays. How many times have you heard the ozone layer mentioned lately? They're talking about global warming. Here's you a real case of global warming. <laughs> it is globally going to get so hot that it'll fry your whiskers when you get outside if you're still here. It's going to be rough. The affected people curse God's name. They don't repent and give Him glory. The Greek word for repent means to change one's mind, carrying with it the idea of turning from good, I mean turning from evil to good and becoming morally better according to Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. It's not simply a matter of forsaking sin. But it is a change and transformation of one's attitude regarding sin. These men, unwilling to do that, will receive the unsufferable judgment and they will blaspheme God. Here again is a group of people that seals their fate when they blaspheme God. Let's go right along. The fifth bowl is next. The fifth bowl. We're looking at verses 10 and 11 now. Still in chapter 16, Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. Isn't that amazing? He's going to get a taste of this now. On the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. They did not repent of their deeds. The fifth angel pours out his bowl of darkness on the throne of the beast, which refers to the Antichrist center of power. This throne was given by the dragon Satan to the beast. And at this point, painful ulcers, lack of drinking water, intense heat, thick darkness, Cause people to gnaw their tongues because of the physical and psychological pain. However, the people continue to blaspheme God and they refuse to repent. I'm going to skip on here just a little bit and go to the sixth bowl. The sixth bowl we find in verses 12 through 16. It takes a little more explanation here for the sixth bowl. Let's look at verses 12 through 16. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. How many of you have heard of the river Euphrates? You've heard of that? They tell me that the Euphrates River is going down every year. Did you know that just before the Battle of Armageddon, she's going to dry up? They're going to drive an army up that riverbed. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs 
which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of Almighty God. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to a place called in Hebrew, say it with me, Armageddon. And they gathered them together to a place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. So when the sixth angel pours out his bowl, it's directed toward the great river Euphrates, and it dries up that river completely. The Euphrates River is the longest and most important river in Western Asia. Therefore, it is called the Great River. That river is 1,700 miles long. That's a long river, 1,700 miles long. It originates in Turkey. It flows through Syria, through Iraq, to join the Tigris before emptying into the Persian Gulf. It's mentioned in the first and the last books of the Bible. It was there in Genesis, and it's still there in Revelation. God put it there with His finger drawing it out in Genesis, and He's going to shut her down in Revelation. Aren't you glad that God's in control? This will take place right at the end of the tribulation period. I mentioned that to you earlier as we began the lesson, just prior to the battle of Armageddon. The pouring out of this vial will greatly aid those who will come from the east, a great and monstrous army, the greatest army the world has ever seen will be coming to the battle of Armageddon to fight against Israel, to fight against Jesus Christ. Its warriors will be slaughtered by the millions. And for this reason, it is called the judgment of God. It's a literal battle, not figurative nor hypothetical. As many people say, I'm going to tell you, and I believe I can say it flat-footed and not back up, it is a literal battle with literal blood being shed. The event does not symbolize the drying up of the Turkish Empire or the breaking up of some as it has been talked. But again, as in the previous vows, we must take this one literally. It all adds up. It all, two and two, all makes four. The river Euphrates is mentioned 21 times in the Bible. And it always refers to an actual river in Asia. It is not used to symbolize anything else. The other vials, the judgments, and the seals are literal. So this one must be literal as well. The drying up of this river prepares the way for the kings of the east to come to the resolute and preordained wrath of God upon the nations at Armageddon. God will take vengeance against those who had a part in persecuting His people. There are three unclean spirits shaped like frogs that come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. These are demon spirits personified who will go forth working miracles and inspiring nations. They will mobilize armies which will march in all directions and in all countries to prevent the establishment of the kingdom of Christ upon earth. These lying spirits working miracles through false prophets cause nations to cooperate with the Antichrist heading toward Armageddon. In his vision, John saw the spirits coming out of the dragon and the two beasts, which are symbolic of the three leaders against Christ at his coming. The dragon represents the devil. We've talked about this before. The beast symbolizes its two earthly men who will be possessed with legions of demons. They will be the Antichrist and his false prophet. We've talked about this before. We said Satan, the Antichrist, and his false prophets. They will be uh, demons that will go forth from these three persons by word of command. They're commanded by Satan. Their purpose is to go to the kings of the earth and to gather them to battle. The, word, the world leaders assemble armies at that time with a Hebrew name called the Valley of Megiddo. This valley will be fought, this battle will be fought in Palestine, not in Europe, as some people have taught. The Valley of Megiddo, or the Valley of Armageddon, 
is located about 15 miles southeast of modern-day Haifa, and this becomes the center of the strife of Armageddon, though obviously the conflict will cover an even larger area in that location. Christ will come as a thief, and sudden destruction will come upon the world of the ungodly. This is a blessing for those who are faithful to Christ and who are watching for Him. We've got five minutes to get into the seventh one, and we may have to come back to it, but let's see what we can do. The seventh vial is found in the latter part of Revelation 16. It's verses 17 through 21. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of His wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men. Each hailstone weighed about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. While demonic forces are gathering the armies of the world in preparation for the battle of Armageddon, there's one more bowl of wrath poured out on the earth. When the seventh angel pours out his bowl into the air, a loud voice comes out of the temple from God's throne saying, It is done. This means the seventh bowl is God's final judgment on planet earth. The seventh bowl causes flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and then this great earthquake such as never been before. Because of the earthquake, the great city is split into three parts. In chapter 11, verse number 8 of Revelation, we learn that the great city is called Sodom, but it is Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified. The city being split into three parts is the beginning of geological alterations that will conclude when Jesus returns. All of this is happening and Jesus is fixing to set His feet down on Mount Olives. It's all going to happen consecutively right in order. The reason I know this, let's look to the Old Testament book of Zechariah chapter 14 verse number 4. And in that day, everybody say that day. That day is this day, the day that we're talking about right now. Not October the 18th, hopefully not that day. It can't be that day. But on this day that we're talking about, on that day, His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two. See, all the way back, in, in, all the way back here in Zechariah, we're hearing this, and then all the way over here in Revelation, what's it saying? It's going to be split. It's going to be split into that mountain's coming apart, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. As a result of the earthquake, the cities of the nations fall, and God gives Babylon the great, her cup filled with the wine of the fury of His wrath. Babylon the Great is the center of the Antichrist empire. We will see this more as we study chapter 17 and chapter 18 as we get on into that. This scene of incredible horror continues as islands disappear and mountains are leveled. Never before has there been an earth, a worldwide earthquake. This whole world is going to shake. There is also a storm with great hailstones. Listen to this. About 100 pounds each falling on people. The largest recorded hailstone in the United States fell on July the 23rd, 2010 in Vivian, South Dakota. Now this was just not too far not too far long ago, July 23rd, 2010, in Vivian, South Dakota, it measured 8 inches in diameter and 18 inches in circumference, and it weighed about 2 pounds. These hailstones are going to weigh 100 pounds apiece. The hailstones of that storm 
back in Vivian, broke through roofs, leaving holes in interior ceilings. The hailstones of the seventh bowl will be 50 times heavier, capable of destroying entire buildings and killing thousands of people worldwide. The survivors of the hailstones will curse God for the plague of the hail and will remain defiant and unrepentant. God's awesome wrath will one day fall on planet earth. Just as when Noah faithfully preached righteousness, 2 Peter 2 and 5 says, a wicked world will refuse to repent and will suffer God's wrath. Matthew 24, 37. God's wrath will one day fall on planet earth. It took one minute long. I apologize for that, but would you stand up with me? Hallelujah. I appreciate each of you being here. I pray that this is of interest to you. Uh, many of you, uh, I'm sure, have wondered why do we need to study all of this if we're going to be gone. We need to be telling those that we're acquainted with, just like the little lantern I gave you Sunday, we need to be letting that little light shine. We need to be warning people, this is coming, and you very well may get an audience from people that you wouldn't have gotten before all of this started happening. You now will have an audience as people are seeing what's happening. The Bible is unfolding. Father, thank you for another day, another Wednesday that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for another opportunity that you've given me to stand before your precious people and to declare your words to your people. God, I'm asking you to let this word be in fertile soil in our hearts and in our lives and let us share it with somebody. Lord, I'm asking you to arrange divine appointments for us as we begin to share with people what the book of Revelation says is going to happen to planet Earth. Lord, I'm asking you to help each of us be ready. Help us to be looking, Lord, to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. And Lord, you said to those that look for him, you shall appear. I praise you for that. I'm looking for you. Now, Lord, if you don't come between now and Sunday morning, I ask you to give us a safe return. God, help us to all come back, be in your house, be in good spirits, be in good health. Watch over us, Lord. Bless your people. Bless them coming. Bless them going. Use us for your glory in everything that we do and touch all of these tremendous, tremendous prayer requests, God. I'm asking you, you know the heart of these people that are hurting. In Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen. If anybody needs prayer, I'll be happy to pray with you. Otherwise, go with God and He will always go with you. Praise the Lord. Be friendly. Hallelujah.